Claire. Yes. <laughs> have you ever planned a STEM family night? No, I have never done it. And I have really been wanting to. So actually it's on my list for this spring to do one because I mean, it's an incredible opportunity to bring community into your school, to bring awareness to your STEM program. So I know that you've done quite a few. Yes. Do you know how many well, you've done? Actually, I did count them at one point and it's over 50. Um, <laughs> I know. I haven't personally done all the logistics for all of those, but as the STEM director at Communities and Schools, I have all these sites that request STEM family night. So we have a whole operation where we kit all the supplies. So we give them to the schools to put on their event. Personally, mm. in charge of the event, all the logistics, I've probably done 12 plus. So, I mean, it, it's still, yeah. And if you count like space club family nights, which are, you know, mm -hmm. different type of family night, a lot of those we would do at every school two a year. And I was at four schools. That's eight a year. Wow. Um, anyway, so I can tell you all about how to put on a family event. And I wanted to talk about that at this podcast because we are bringing them back. So with the <laughs> global pandemic, everything kind of shut down, but schools are now starting to want to have these events very carefully. Um, so we've had to change some kind of our protocols, but they're back. I have 12 STEM nights lined up for the spring semester at schools across San Antonio. And so I thought, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you can put on a STEM family night. Since you're doing it, I'm going to walk you through it. Oh, please. I need all the help. So I know what they are just from how you've been doing them and we have a guide and so I've read about them, but can you give me the basics of what a STEM night is if so I can define it to my principal and administration? So a STEM family night is meant to be a hands-on event. So parents grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, everybody comes to this event and there are stations throughout. So we, the way I organize it and I found works best, you don't control it. You just let it happen. Okay. So I recommend um, five to six stations when you're first starting out. If you're going to have a lot of people go up to eight, but don't, eight just seems to be kind of the magic number of number of stations at these like big events to, to manage. So let me walk you through as a participant. Okay. So you are a parent walking into the school, probably the cafeteria or the gym, and there is this nice welcome table. You sign in and you get a passport. It is your STEM night passport. And this has all the stations that are at the event. So somewhere between six to eight stations. And it says, in the cafeteria, we have space docking and slime and rocketry. In the gym, we have a build a boat or microscope mystery. So it on, on this passport, it tells you where and what. And your goal as a family member, as a student, is to go to each station and get a stamp of completion. So you do the activity, you start wherever you want, take as long as you want at the station. And to incentivize that, we will give you some popcorn or hot dogs or slushies or whatever the school wants to do as a a prize. So if you maybe complete half the stations, say four stations, they'll give you something. And you can also do a raffle. So you can turn in your completed passport to win a telescope or a robot or whatever. Are you pumped? I am so excited. I want to win a robot, a telescope and popcorn. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know if you want to do all of them, but depending on your budget <laughs> at the school. But it's really fun. And so that is my first recommendation is don't control it too much. Just kind of let it happen. Let people walk around, do what's interesting to them. Um, but to get you ready, Claire, for your STEM night, I'm going to walk you through the five steps for the ultimate STEM family night. You ready? I'm ready to take notes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Step one, get help. I know you do everything on your own and you're like a take charge, but you need help for this to be successful. Okay. So how much help and who? <laughs> so first you need your admin on board. So principal, whoever saying, Hey, I'm doing this. Here's what it is. Pick the date, kind of figure out the logistics. 
And then you need volunteers for the day of the event. So you're going to have eight stations. You physically cannot run all of the stations. Mm -hmm. And so I would recommend at least two people per station. One is kind of like the lead in charge, maybe a science teacher, math teacher, like the content expert. And then the other person, if not one, maybe multiple people can help high school uh, students, parents, other teachers, um, PTA, wherever you can find people. Um, I've been brought in, like if you're doing a middle school event, uh, NHS, like the National Honor Society needs volunteer hours. The robotics team could come in and run a robotics station. So there's ways to get creative. I said parents, but you got to be careful because the parents want to be at the event as participants because mm. it's a family night. So gotcha. maybe not ask your parents unless they're super involved and <laughs> want to run a station. Um, and then planning it. You don't want to really plan it all on your own. So forming a committee. Usually these events that I've seen at schools are run by the science department. So the chair kind of leads it with all the support of the other science teachers. And then she assigns a station to each teacher who then is in charge of getting volunteers. So how far in advance do you recommend I start planning all this and recruiting people? Um, two months is what I recommend. Two to three months, ideally. I've put them on in a couple weeks. Like, I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> Your the biggest challenge is having the stations ready. So if you're in San Antonio, you can just call me up and I'll give you all the stations ready to go, right? But if you're starting from scratch, maybe you bought our STEM night planning guide and you're trying to put all the supplies together, give yourself time to do that. Marketing, that's the other one. Mm -hmm. Getting the word out, getting the kids excited. It's gonna take you a couple weeks at least. Okay, that's wise. Yep. All right. Ready for step number two? Yes. Okay. You have the help, the support. Now you've got to pick the date and the schedule. And that seems like, oh, that's easy. Well, you're going to have to avoid testing and football games and <laughs> all the other stuff mm -hmm. happening. And then the other trick is when you're going to host it. So I have two options here that I've tried. You could go right after school. So let's say, what time does the bell ring? 3.30. 3.30. You could start at 3.45 and the kids are there. They have, they can't go home. So they're like, come right to your event. But what's going to happen if it's right after school? What can you imagine? A lot of the parents can't come and it's going to be mass chaos trying to get set up and all that. <laughs> yep. So I've had some schools do like a movie hour. And so if they don't want kids to oh. leave, they put them all in the library and put on like a space theme movie or like Bill Nye, I don't know, something STEM related while the teachers are setting up. So it kind of gives them mm -hmm. some time. So that's one option if you're a smaller school. Most of the events I've seen though are later in the evening to accommodate working parents. So the kids go home, the parents get home, pick them up, take them back to the school. Maybe around 5.30 you start the event. So like 5.30 to 7.30. But if you do it then, you got to think about food. So in my schools, they really, really want food. So we'll do like pizza or something kind of cheap to get them there and excited and doing events, but they have to earn it. They got to get the passport to get some pizza. Awesome. And you usually, you said they don't have to get a stamp from every station. Is it usually like half of the stations? Yep. So it depends okay. on the length of the event. And so if you want them to stay longer, you add more stations for is a good number because then they kind of get so here if you do too few say two stations they're going to do two stations and leave right and i don't want mm -hmm. that to happen so if you have eight stations half four is a good number okay okay so you figured out the logistics um as you're thinking through the date you can also consider depending on the size of your school, if you want people to RSVP for the event. So if there's some kind of like click here to tell us you're coming, if you're getting food, I found that's like a logistical nightmare to try to collect. <laughs> like, you know, who's coming, who's not, how much food I just estimate and hope it works out. <laughs> Gosh. Okay. So that's the chaos of a STEM night, which is it, any planning of these events right out of school. Right. Um, and then step three are the stations the activities that um, you would do at this event. So what kind of activities are you thinking, Claire? 
I want a wide variety of things to showcase different science concepts, robotics, maybe something that uses augmented reality or some other kind of technology. You know, the shiny stuff is what usually draws crowds because they're like, ooh, they're doing something really fancy in STEM. So yes. I'd want to make sure I reach like engineering, science topics, technology stuff. So what are your favorites? Yeah. Well, let me start with what I do not recommend Ooh, for okay. a station. If you're going to bring in outside people, which is something I recommend. So if there's a local organization, I've brought in library centers, science centers, other people that want to help put on an event. Great way to get volunteers. Do not have them do talks or presentations. I've seen schools do that. No one's going to go. <laughs> no, no way. Yeah. And then don't just have them stand with a display. Like, hey, I'm Lockheed Martin. I'm an engineer. Come talk to me. Mm -mm. Kids will not do that. Has to be something hands-on. But when we're doing hands-on, it's got to be simple. Imagine someone coming to the station. They will want to spend about 10 minutes. That's how much time is the typical amount of time at a station. So don't go overly complicated. One thing um, I've learned is quick and easy and not too messy. Okay. You can, it's a balance. So mm -hmm. we've done like strawberry DNA is like a really fun science one. It's really better for a classroom, right? Because yeah. with that one, it's messy. And then you're trying to teach them something. And it's really hard to teach concepts at a chaotic STEM event. So if we back up here, what's the purpose of a STEM night? It is to get them inspired and engaged and just have the big picture of like STEM. Like what is this engineering thing? What is science mm -hmm. all about? Making it fun and exciting. You're really not going to teach them a lot in this 10 minute chaotic come and go type of event. So like you said, flashy and fun, great photo op. And they walk away just pumped about STEM. Yeah. So do you recommend doing some of the stations as things that maybe the kids have done in the STEM program before? So they could be like, hey, oh, I did this in STEM class. Let me show you, mom and dad. I already know how to do this. So that their parents are like, whoa, cool. Yes, exactly. So when we did Space Club Family Nights, it would be like the Space Lander. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would have the Space Club leaders run that station. And so they would have people coming in and they would be like, oh, I've done this. And they would help them build their lander, explain it. Another idea is a showcase. So Makey Makey. Have you done Makey Makey? Oh, yeah. All right. Explain the concept on that one. So Makey Makey is this amazing invention where you can turn anything into a controller. So you plug it into a computer or tablet and it's this like electrical, um, what would you call it? Motherboard kind of thing. Yeah. And it has all these alligator clips and you can attach the alligator clips into anything that conducts electricity. So that could be pencil lead on paper or bananas or water buckets. And then you can <laughs> use those different items as keys on the keyboard to play a video game or to play a piano that's on the a laptop. Right amazing. Yeah. So when you walk up, if you can imagine like a laptop with this piano on the, the screen and you're tapping bananas and it's <laughs> making music happen. So what I had students do in the past is they create their own video game so they can oh. code it in scratch and then they create the controller out of aluminum foil and Play-Doh or whatever. And then it's set up at the family night and we actually made it a competition. So the parents came and tried out all of the controllers and then voted for their favorite. It's just like oh, that's fun. fun. Little... Yeah. So if you can get your kids involved and especially if you're showcasing projects, parents want to come. Yes, absolutely. Right? So now let's get back to the stations of what I would recommend. Quick, right? 10 minutes yes. or less accessible to a wide range of ages. You're going to mm -hmm. have, if you're elementary or middle school, it could be, you know, the siblings coming. So there might be five-year-olds coming all the way to their elderly grandparents to the age of 80 plus, right? We want to <laughs> be accessible to everybody. And so it needs to be simple enough, but where you can differentiate and make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. And not all your stations are going to meet that criteria, but at least thinking about it as you're picking your stations. Hands-on should be 
designing and building something and not so much a step-by-step -step craft. And that's just a general thought of STEM challenges, but it's really important at this event, you're not gonna have the chance to say, step one, glue this and attach it here in the chaos, like let them build, give them the constraints. So we do straw rockets and we're like, okay, you need to build a nose cone and a fin. How are you gonna do it is up to you. You know, here's an example if you wanna have it, but it should be open-ended where they can create and design. Perfect, yes. And then simple on the supplies. So you don't wanna have to buy a ton of stuff if you can make it non-consumable. So one of the stations I like, I call Amazing Architects. And they walk up to the station, they have this little pencil box and they open it and inside are either straw builders or Zoob. So these like easy hmm. to use manipulatives. And there's a task card that says, build a tower taller than you. So they have what's in this box to build a really tall tower. With the zoo, I have one that's build an animal. So it's more abstract. <laughs> and so they can build a giraffe or a dog or however they can come up with a way to build um, something that mimics like an animal's shape. So that's like a really simple one that once you've done the station once, you could have it for years to come and not have to buy new stuff. I like that. That really helps if you're a small school with a very limited budget. Yeah. You don't have to buy all the things. And you asked me what my favorites are. So I'm going to give you a couple more. Yes. So that was one. Build a boat is a classic, right? You get a bucket of water and you have the students build an aluminum foil boat to hold pennies or little plastic bears that you can buy. And that's like a perfect all age activity. Yeah. So another thing that I was thinking is a lot of these, you said, try not to do anything that's too messy. And that would definitely apply to my school because we are would have to borrow a space. We don't have a gym or a cafeteria really. So we'd probably have to borrow a like space in the church that we're attached to. Ooh, you so be obviously slime would probably be out of the question there. Let's talk about slime. Yeah. Can we talk about that? <laughs> okay. So I have gone back and forth on whether I like slime or not. I have done it many a STEM night. It gets the kids there because they're, I don't know if it's kind of dying out now, but there was this obsession with slime and all the YouTubers were making slime and they're adding glitter and all the things. Yes. It is so chaotic, so messy, requires so many supplies that I have banned it from all my STEM nights. So if a school <laughs> asks for slime, I say no. <laughs> you may have amazing architects to build out of Zoom. <laughs> That is pretty much my philosophy. Yes. Yep. Let's not do the slime. Let's not do it. But there's just so many other fun ones um, that you can do. So I have an activity called space docking. Have you done space docking? Oh, docking? yeah. Love space docking. All right. Tell them about it. So it's a teamwork activity, which is why I love it so much and do it so often at the beginning of the year. And what you do is I do it with dog bowls. I know that you've done it with uh, PVC. <laughs> it just sounds so funny. I know. <laughs> Well, okay. So here's the problem. I live in a small town. We don't have a hardware store that carries large, um, you use like PVC joints, right? Yeah. Are they, are mm -hmm. they joints? What do you, what do you call I don't know those? what they are. Rings. They're, yeah. Or pipes. They, pipes that can like nest in each other. Mm -hmm. yep. So I don't have access to that here. So I went to Walmart and I said, what nests in each other? That's also ring shaped that could hold a ball. And I found these nesting dog food bowls <laughs> and it was perfect because they were plastic. So I could drill through them. So you drill holes through the circumference on around whatever you're using, whatever is circular that can hold a ball. And then in those holes, you tie rope. So you have, I think I have like six or yeah, seven, six. Mm -hmm. six ropes coming out that are maybe maximum of eight feet in length or so and then you have a ball like a um you can use like a beach ball or those larger what, what are those uh just i don't know like when you walk into walmart and there's that big tower <laughs> yes. of the little kid balls that's what you want <laughs> yeah recreational whatever balls yeah you put them on the ring that you just made and put the other uh because you buy two of whatever you're nesting so one, you drill the holes in and attach ropes to it. The other one, you just leave alone and you put it somewhere off 
uh, I don't know, like what, oh, 10 yards you? away or so, yeah. however much room you have. Right. And then you have the kids have to lift the bowl that's attached to all the ropes with the kids each holding one rope and balancing the ball in the middle. Yep. And we'll have to, we'll link in the show notes so you can see what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's kind of hard to describe. <laughs> and they have to carry it all the way to nest or dock into the other ring that you have sitting off in the distance without the ball falling off. And it's an amazing activity because the kids have to learn how to communicate with each other and how to move in a coordinated fashion. And it can be really frustrating for them at first, which makes the victory all so much sweeter. <laughs> and I can see how at a STEM night, it would be amazing because you're involving their parents that are probably like, oh, I could do that. And then they're like just the, on the same level as the kids, right? <laughs> And they're all just like communicating. And a lot of my family speak Spanish. So, you know, when they start speaking Spanish, <laughs> serious. It's getting real. <laughs> I saw someone do this with just a metal ring. So you don't have to drill holes. Okay. Like you could just tie it to a ring. It's not going to dock in the same way. But I think the concept, if you can get the ring to just land, you could have a marker on the ground mm. where you want it to sit. It's just like an easier way to do it. But yes, that's a good one because it's team building and there's space between the participants. Now with COVID, there's like kind of these new rules to follow. There you go. Social distancing. Activity. Social distancing. <laughs> exactly. Forced. Forced social distancing. <laughs> All right. Another great one I call microscope mystery and my science teachers love it. So what I do is you can buy these pretty cheap USB microscopes off of Amazon. You plug it into a Chromebook, a laptop, whatever. And so whatever you're seeing in the microscope shows up on the screen. So it's nice and big. And then we create these little uh, task cards and it gives you a hint. And there's a slide on the card and you're trying to guess what you're looking at. Oh, cool. And so it could be like human hair, plant cells, or the cells of a stomach in a dog. Oh. is a really random one. And you could buy these kits off of Amazon. <laughs> but it's like the grosser, the better. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And then there's a, a little fun fact on the back. So one side is the slide that they have to guess what it is. And then they flip it over. And then it tells you what it is. And that's a really easy one. You have to get those USB microscopes, but it's a great one. Robotics, you mentioned that one. Mm -hmm. If you have a set of Sphero, you can bring those out have a little maze, have them, you know, drive it around. They could even compete. We turn it into a chariot challenge. So they have some building materials. Um, you could even use Zoob or other stuff that's not just consumables to build a chariot. So it has to drag two ping pong balls to the end and it's a race. And it's really fun because the ping pong balls are flying off and <laughs> kind of enjoyable. Competition is always great to have as a station. And I have this really great video of this chariot chase uh, and this dad is like freaking out. So he takes the tablet from his son and is like, no. And he's like, he wants to win and he ends up winning and he's just like cheering. And I was like, okay, let's calm down here. But <laughs> So you can get some really good insight on your students by seeing how their parents <laughs> react at these stations and be like, that explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually, principals told me that parents come to these events because they're and other types of events, the parents are just talked at. Like you have teacher meetings or you're coming to learn about some new program at the school. They just sit and listen and leave. But here they're getting to learn with their kids. And that's what's really unique. And I just, that's why I love these events. So true. Great point. All right. Should I give you more? Yes. What, what's next? <laughs> Let me give you a couple more and then we'll move on to the final step. Okay. So, any type of design challenge that's pretty simple. So I've done Space Lander or like drag device. Rocketry is probably my all-time favorite. If you can invest in those Pitsco straw rocket launchers, oh my gosh, they will freak out. Those things go over 100 feet in distance. So that is a perfect STEM night. If you can't afford those hoop gliders, piece of straw and two piece of uh, paper hoops on either end is like a great throw something, see how far it goes paper airplanes, if you want to keep it simple, is another good one. Uh, catapults, popsicle mm. sticks, rubber bands, you can have a lot of fun. Um, if you want to add some more technology, snap circuits are a great one. They can use a little workbook and just pick a design like a buzzer or an alarm, and the parents really get into those activities. And then 
let me give you one more. Um, so backyard brains, I think is what they're called. Uh, they have this robotic claw that you control with your mind. So it, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so on. the station is literally called use your mind to move the robotic arm okay okay and so claire's like i want to see this <laughs> so we will understand. link we will link this in the show notes but basically you put on these two um what are they called the ecg stickers i don't know what that stands for but basically it's uh trying to get the waves of your brain are moving your arm, right? You're sending an electrical signal to your arm to open. Echocardiogram. Thank you. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so you're attaching that to your hand. And so when you open your hand, there is a robotic claw attached and it opens the robotic arm. And then you close your hand and the robotic arm closes. So wait, so this is like the prostheses that mm -hmm. you see where they're using this technology for kids or adults who may have lost their limb and they can that you can buy that like you can buy that <laughs> it is a kit that you can get and we will link it because it's one of my stations that we're trying out this year that's amazing yeah i want one yeah it's one of those ooh flashy <laughs> <You're right. laughs> okay so go ahead sorry i was gonna ask like what what is the station like what is the goal to use that we call it control the claw <laughs> so they have to like pick up something or yeah. mm -hmm. okay yeah That's so they awesome. try to control it to move it but it's really just to show them this technology and just how cool it is yes but you have to make sure that wh whoever the volunteer is at that station has seen toy story so that they can say the claw <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> you just have like a tv there playing yes. it on loop you have to always say it that way mm -hmm. and that reminds me you could theme these nights right you could have a space themed stem night a i don't know biology you think beyond space <laughs> i know i have a really hard time but if you do space themed you could bring out the local astronomy association you could have a planetarium oh. show i've done that before where they oh, have those like cool. pop up yeah there's just so much cool stuff i mean space is just cool Okay, <laughs> let's get them to the end here. So we've selected our stations. That's number three. Step four is marketing the event. So getting kids to show up. That's where you want to make sure there's an incentive, raffle prize, food, whatever it is. Um, that's what I recommend to get people there. You can also give extra credit. So if you're a science teacher, say, mm -hmm. if you come to the event and bring me your passport, you know, I'll give you a couple points on a homework or something. And then the last part is the final prep and logistics. And so here I recommend becoming friends with your custodial staff and giving them a map and saying, here is what I want. I will help you do it, but they would like some notice. And when they have a map, they know, okay, here's how many tables we need, how many chairs, the refreshment station, having help kind of setting that up, creating the passport. Um, so that's printed uh, for the event. And then just all the little details from right before the event, setting up the stations, making sure there's signs, telling people where to go. This is the control the claw station. This is a build a boat station. And then have an amazing event. Awesome. And I am so thankful that you've done a lot of the legwork already for this. So that if you choose to do one of these activities for a station, like the ones that you've mentioned, there's, I'm assuming, stuff to already create poster boards. Because you have at each station, like a big trifold board that has the name of the station and all of the instructions so any volunteers wouldn't go there and be like what do i do with this it's like yep. all there right yep so what i do with my kits and that's what's in our bundle on tpt is you can print out the instructions so the idea is a volunteer can come 30 minutes before the event read the instructions and know how to put it on it's Amazing. meant to be that easy um so you can print out those instructions have the supplies and then, yes, there is a template for a poster to print. So you can just print it out and have it hanging there. If you want to get really fancy, um, you can buy. Uh, I've done them handmade. I've also printed them. Those trifold board, like you have like science fair. Mm -hmm. So it could say build a boat and have like career connections and science connections. Extra fancy, put in a QR code and it takes them to like a website or a video, an app they can download. Um, lots of ways to kind of you know, enhance your STEM night. But if you're just starting out, 
just stick with a simple, you know, sign and the, the materials. But as you get better at it, you kind of see what works, what doesn't, and you can, you know, elevate the event. But I say step one, keep it simple. Pick activities you know the kids are going to love, are not too messy, are very fun and hands-on and engaging, and then it'll be a great event. Amazing. Well, I'm so excited to get to put one on this spring. And with all of these ideas, I'm, I'm really starting to think now, like I want to, I want to get started right now. So <laughs> go build I'll, the control, the claw. I feel like that's going to happen at your school. I'm ordering that today for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that gives everybody kind of a good overview on how to put on your STEM family night. If you put these on, we would love for you to tag us on social media or ask us any questions that you have. Um, but those are your five steps to successfully putting on a STEM family night. But let's chat soon again, Claire. All right. Bye.